I want you to think about all the lectures you've ever attended in your lifetime. All of them. And now try and remember them all, visualise them, and in your head create a kind of composite image, a composite feeling of what all those lectures add up to. Have you got a, an impression of that now? Just take a minute, keep that, that vision in your head. Just put it in the back of your head, keep it in mind, and while we proceed on this experiment, I want you to ask yourself the question, is this here now? Is this a lecture? A lecture is derived from the word to read. It's connected to the original situation of reading from a book to a gathered audience, something you'd find in monasteries or medieval universities. So it's reading from a text, reading from a book. The dictionary definition here in the um, Random House Dictionary of the English Language speaks of a lecture as such. A discourse read or delivered before an audience, especially for instruction or to set forth some subject, a lecture on Picasso's paintings, for example. A speech of warning or reproof as to conduct, a long, tedious reprimand. That's the second meaning of it. To give a lecture or series of lectures. And the other meaning is, perhaps, to rebuke, to reprimand at some length. He lectured the child regularly, but with little effect. The reason I'm interested in the lecture as a social phenomena is it is one of the generic spaces in which cultural knowledge is transmitted. Knowledge which has been validated as somehow socially useful because it's within the system of the university knowledge which is therefore somehow locked in to the dominant systems of power. But in a way it's about the form or the structure of a lecture itself, or the structures in which lecturing as a cultural phenomena take place. I suppose I'm taking a structuralist approach to it, Structure, we have a sense of things being organised within space and understood all in one moment. That gives us a synchronic interpretation of the world versus a diachronic interpretation, which is nearly the other axis entirely, the one about time, the one that takes us through points in history. So someone interested in historical materialism perhaps is combining both of those. Understanding history from a structural materialist point of view. So you have the subject of knowledge, the one who is supposed to know, and this persona or personification of knowledge embodied is something that Foucault explores in his uh, kind of structural analysis of power and knowledge. But it's also something that is really dependent upon one's speaking position and how easy it is for you to assume an authoritative speaking position. And you find that within society, culturally, certain bodies are inscribed into the systems of power and are able to assume a position from which to speak with authority. For example, to speak um, academic discourses with a kind of uh, confidence that their words will be heard. And then there are some who are excribed or written out of the structure. And for them it's very difficult to find a position in which they can speak with authority.
the one who knows. One could characterise the traditional lecture and the traditional relationship between lecturer and student as a situation in which there is one who knows. The one who knows and the one who supposes the one knows. The one who knows. The, the supposed subject of knowledge. It's a position of power. The question of the authority of the speaking subject also has something to say about the way in which the subject has become decentered as a rational conscious speaking being. And this takes us back to Freud and his discovery of the unconscious. It's a drastic thing that he did. He split open uh, our sense of our, our identity and our confidence that we knew what we were talking about. He introduced the understanding or the recognition of the unconscious as something that motivated us in our actions and which came through in speech in all sorts of ways. So topics under discussion here are uh, questions of history, question of, uh, of how time moves on. It's about how the Enlightenment project has maybe come to an abrupt end, progress. We don't believe in progress anymore. It's something to do with the postmodern state, postmodernity, in which uh, truth, we've given up on that. We're dealing with relativisms all the time. Uh, things are all related and um, validated in relation to each other, not in terms of some transcendental, real or transcendental truth. <coughs> Perhaps it's also about the breakdown in grand narratives. Not a bad thing in itself, but if we don't have any big stories, how do we, how do we project ourselves into the future? It's this movement from a sense of being rooted or grounded in the past and moving into the future that is uh, crucial to what I'm trying to explore here. And that's why the question of transmission of knowledge is relevant. That's why the how of teaching and the what of teaching is relevant. And I'm concerned about it in terms of artistic creativity. But how do we go on? How do we, how do we move forward? Have we reached a kind of impasse? Is this melancholic attitude a kind of stuck mourning um, which cannot digest itself and move forward. How do we inherit the past? How do we understand our cultural past? How do we digest it? How do we incorporate it? And how do we then move into the future? How do we move forward? How do we inherit the past as artists? And how do we make something new? What role does, does uh, something which may be characterised as a, as a kind of psychic, emotional dynamic, something like mourning or mournfulness or melancholy I have in relation to that. How can we take apart the different understandings, the different interpretations, the different knowledges available to us and make them useful to us as artists? What kind of knowledge do we need in order to move forward as artists?